Well, thank you, Mike, and it has been a pleasure. I should note that if this is the first time you attend this session, don't despair. We have all the previous talks recorded on the SPSS, SPS community donor now, um, so check that out. With that, I'm very excited that we end with a talk on climate change and on climate modeling, and I'm even more happier to, 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 to have gotten Philip Stier to attend and to give a talk. Um, Philip Stier is a professor of atmospheric physics and head of atmospheric, oceanic, and planetary physics at Oxford University and a fellow at the New Rubin College. He leads the Climate Processes Group and serves on the steering board of the Oxford Climate Research Network, which brings together over 170 scientists across the natural, social, and engineering sciences to study ways to better address and mitigate uh, climate change. And they're very interesting events, actually, I checked this out. And there's one upcoming on the 7th of July on accelerating climate science with AI that is moderated by Philip Stier. So check that out. I'll post a link in the chat. I should also say that Philip Stier is a great communicator having taught the very basics of climate science to over a thousand people from around the world at the Oxford School of Climate Change, which I also highly recommend. And I'm gonna post a link there. In general, the Oxford uh, Climate Society has a wonderful YouTube channel with speakers and from Noam Chomsky to the director of PIC to activists to journalists. So I encourage you to check that out. But I get sidetracked with all the amazing stuff that's happening in Oxford. Uh, Philip Stier, um, uh, his research focuses on the physical climate processes in the context of human caused climate change and air pollution, and in particular on these pesky clouds and uh, aerosols and their interaction and the role in the, in the, in the climate. Uh, and he'll talk about climate modeling across scales from individual single molecules all the way up to the Paris Agreement. So I'm very excited to hear, uh, to hear your talk, Philip. Please take it away. Well, thank you very much for the for the invitation and for the kind introduction and while I set up, I should say, I, I, I totally agree that the, the uh, Oxford Climate Society, our student society is, is doing an amazing job in, in getting things set up much better sometimes than us busy academics can get done ourselves. So the students are really ruling. It's an interesting exercise to give a talk to an audience that you know so little about. Fabian obviously helped me a little bit, but I think you're a quite diverse audience. So, so I try to pitch it interesting enough, um, but not too boring. Uh, so it's a, a challenge, I guess. Uh, so can I check that you see my screen? Okay, great. So then uh, let's just get started right away. So this is about climate modeling across scales. And it's probably fair to say climate modeling has been one of these, yeah, big simulation projects since now 30, 40 years, and this is tremendously successful in some, some senses. Sorry, our dog uh, likes our son, uh, so my son just came home. Uh, and we will really follow this exercise from a single molecule to the Paris Agreement. So I really want to highlight uh, that from very small scale processes uh, up to the global scale and then into the politics is something we need to consider, and that is tremendously challenging. So we'll start with a, a climate model. And if I asked you what a climate model is, m probably many of you might have quite different ideas and we tend to do this with our students, but what is a climate model? Um, for most people, it's nothing more than that. Uh, for most people, a climate model is an interesting model that uh, they use as a black box and that's good enough. And once you lift sort of the box, the climate model can be this. It can be just a simple one line equation, just a simple Im impulse response model here that, that describes the global mean response of the climate system actually remarkably well. So, so some things can be quite simple. But then a climate model can be for someone else, something very different. And that is now a full blown, very complex climate model. And it is on a very high resolution scale and it simulates here uh, in great detail uh, the global aerosol cycles that we will come back to in just a minute later. But what is behind this? Because this effectively is a nice movie, so it's still a black box. Uh, you still don't know anything about it, what this climate model, uh, what drives this climate model, how does it work and what might it do? So inside this box, inside this climate model is more something like this, actually a whole book of it. So it tends to be really a whole book of equations that's being solved. For some of you who are a bit familiar with this, what you see here is sort of the first two equations are momentum equations, so Navier-Stokes equations and spherical coordinates. 
then there's an energy conservation equation and then there's conservation of traces like water and ice and things like that in the atmosphere. So all of this needs to be solved and I won't at all go into the details of any of the maps or how we solve it in, in, in numerical terms, but that is what is behind many, many climate models that simulate then the global circulation. So I'll just go very briefly, I'll just put up this slide because I think people find it sometimes helpful. So a climate model can have all different hierarchies. You can go from a single, single box model. So the first model I showed, the simple impulse response model is just an energy balance model and uh, it has no dimensionality or anything. Uh, and it can go all the way in complexity through single column schemes that we use to test the response of say clouds to climate perturbations, all the way to what we call general circulation models that circulate in the, uh, uh, simulate the circulation of the atmosphere and the oceans and so on. But then it goes a bit further that people really think of climate models as being parts of earth system models. So an earth system models then tries to simulate all the compartments that are relevant of the earth system that you have to include. For most of this talk, though, I will talk about the general circulation model. That is what most people would naturally assume is a climate model, and that's quite widely used for, for assessing uh, man-made climate change. By the way, I should say it's a small enough group. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point if something is unclear or if you'd like any, any detail on anything. It's much better to have a conversation. So how does... A general circulation model work and what are the main main issues so effectively in a general circulation model we take the earth and we tend to discretize it in some way and without discussing the detail of how we discretize it so you have an effective grid that you that you span around the earth and that can be either done a, a lat long grid or a irregular grid or it can be in spherical uh, harmonics so, so there's very different ways of doing that and, and it, they all have the benefits and disadvantages in some sense. And on this resolved scale grid of a climate model, we solve the equations that are already hinted at. So you basically solve conservation of momentum, mass, energy, and you have equations of state that tell you sort of phases uh, of, different, of different constituents. So that is, in a way, you, you could almost say that is the simple part, because that's the stuff where we know the equations perfectly well. And it's just a matter of having good numerical methods to solve them, but we're quite good at this. So, so the, we can actually do this qu quite well. The difficulty is in general in climate modeling that the earth is big and many of the things that we care about are quite small. So a big part of the problem is to um, simulate these things that are on the unresolved scale. And what I, what I mean by this is a typical climate model, and we come back to that later, the scales here of the grid spacing is say on the order 50 to 100 kilometer for climate models that are used in, in long simulations. But many of these things we care about like clouds and aerosols, which we discuss or chemistry or vegetation processes, they can happen on some processes on molecular scale, but then also small scale turbulence of tens, hundreds meters is really relevant and, and can drive the, the feedbacks that are really important for climate change. And we need to represent these in some way. And I'll talk a little bit about it and uh, we'll be entirely biased and mostly talk about clouds and aerosols, but also because clouds and aerosols are really what drives the uncertainty in most of these climate models. And then once you have this all packaged together, you, you, we basically tend to use fairly big computers. So the computers can't be big enough at them or have never been big enough for, for all the things we want to do. And with, with advantages, or advances in computing, we really make big step changes. And I'll, I'll end on that note uh, at the end of the talk as well. So just to give you a sense, so this is sort of how then climate models evolve with computing to some degree. So these are uh, subsequent IPCC assessment report. So this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And every five years you get a new report and every five years you see the model resolution roughly goes a bit, uh, improves a little bit. But you see, if you keep going on this on the scale, you still stay on core scales for quite some time. 
And actually in the last report or so, it stayed roughly at the same scale. So, so this alone will not address some of the uh, issues that remain in, in climate modeling. What's also important to point out actually, it's not just the resolution of what you want to resolve in the atmosphere or ocean that is uh, poorly resolved in, in these coarse models, but also things like mountains. When you look at the orography shown here, in the first assessment reports, there were no Alps pretty much uh, because uh, they're just not resolved when you average out on this scale. And obviously you can see that for regional climate, this will have quite distinct impacts. So these models are useful. Uh, that's maybe a point. So they're useful for many bits uh, for prediction of the future, but also for attribution of climate change to, to the underlying causes. And obviously we won't discuss in great detail if, if climate change is man-made or not, because the evidence is, is quite unambiguous. But here uh, you can use a climate model like the uh, ensemble of climate models shown in blue here to simulate the temperature normally from sort of pre-industrial to present day times. And you just run this with natural forcings only. So you don't change greenhouse gases and aerosols. And what you basically see is that this simulated curve differs quite a bit from the observed temperature record. So that tells you that with natural forcings alone, you can't reconstruct the, the temperature history of earth. And then if you put all the forcings in that we know about and, and the anthropogenic perturbations, including greenhouse gases and other bits, which we will discuss, then you can get a much better agreement. And, and so that is quite often the first, it's a, in a way it's a poor man's evaluation, but it's a really important test that a climate model or a model needs to be able to simulate test cases in the past in our case, that's it. We only have one realization, unfortunately. Um, but you need to be able to simulate that reliably um, before you uh, trust predictions in the future. And it's quite interesting to see for us that in many other fields of simulation-based sciences, uh, there are still areas where people try to make predictions in the future without actually trying to handcast the past. So you could say you're satisfied, that looks good. And this is a similar plot as before. This is an ensemble here of climate models. And again, you have the observations in black and this is the temperature normally on the left and you see the, by and large, this looks quite promising. Many, many people take this as, as a selling point uh, that, that yeah, the job is done to some degree. But I want to draw your attention to, to something that's often overseen in these plots. And that is when you look on the left hand side, the axis here is what's called the temperature anomaly. And that is the uh, anomaly from sort of some reference state. So, uh, here yeah, it's, it's, I'm not exactly sure what, what the reference period is. But when you look in the same plot here on the right hand axis and look carefully, you see that is the absolute temperatures actually. And that is uh, quite disturbing. When you think of it, these climate models have difference in temperatures, a range in temperatures from so in the global mean 12 point something to almost 15 point something. So the, the bias of some of these models, even in the global mean, is, is bigger than the signal we're trying to predict in the global mean. That doesn't mean the trend is not a meaningful outcome, but it, these models are far from perfect. And also important for, for the climate impacts, when we look at the precipitation, which drives a lot of the impacts that matter for, for societies and, and, and biosystems, when you, the left-hand side shows here for three different models, uh, their biases as compared to satellite observations. And you see their persistent biases with the, with the yeah, cloud decks, in particular the convection in the tropics, so the intertropical conversion zone. But when you again take this bias that the models have in the base state and compare it to the predicted change under climate change, then the absolute bias is often bigger than the change we have to predict. So there are still huge challenges to get these models improved is the take home message from this. So why, what are the key processes that drive the uncertainty? And without proving this, I will just state that the clouds have a big role to play in this. And the reason of that is that clouds are this multi-scale phenomenon that really where you have to start at the molecular scale all the way to the globe to, to represent it well. And that comes with limitations. So the question is here, what, yeah, what roles do clouds have in the climate system? And I'll just briefly touch on this. So you see here 
a satellite image or a satellite movie from space, from a weather satellite. And you see it in the visible and you see it in the infrared. And the fact that you see it in the visible tells you that these, when the clouds appear there, they reflect sunlight back to space. And that's why they appear in the satellite sensor as white objects. So they, uh, in the visible wavelengths, they would uh, cool the Earth system by reflecting sunlight back to space. While in the infrared, here the color is actually inverted. In the infrared, the uh, clouds uh, absorb and re-emit the uh, radiation that's emitted from the surface well, it's, uh, due to its temperature. And the higher the clouds uh, are, the lower the temperature at which they re-emit, and therefore they lower the emission of outgoing long-wave radiation. Therefore, actually, a high cloud has a warming effect because it will effectively trap the otherwise outgoing radiation from the surface into space. So this is a nice picture. We can be a bit more quantitative than that, obviously. Um, so this is the same picture from the satellite if you measure it with a, with a very well calibrated instrument. And it gives you then these cloud radiative effects in the short wave, long wave, and in the net. And what you see, you get this long wave warming effect, you get the short wave cooling effect, but the net effect is on the order in the global mean minus 20 watts, minus 21 watts per square meter. So just to give you a sense of this um, without probing now your knowledge, when you think of uh, this cloud radiative effect of on the order of 20 watts, minus 20 watts, uh, you have to compare this to a radiative effect of uh, carbon dioxide driving global climate change of uh, about 1.7 watts per square meter. So the effect of clouds is very big. So if we change clouds by just a little bit, by say 10% in the radiative effect, they could entirely offset global warming. So that's why they need to be represented well in, in a climate model. So what are the things we need to consider of clouds in climate models? So how do they actually affect then the general circulation in a, in a general circulation model? And it is actually a bit of a myriad of processes. So you have the first, the zeroth order question is how much cloud is there? You need to uh, simulate the cloud amount. And in these general circulation models, you don't have a explicit way of doing that. So you basically generally parameterize this in terms of some of the resolved variables. For example, the relative humidity you can derive from temperature and, and uh, the humidity uh, uh, that you actually know and explicitly resolve. Then they have a huge amount of what's called cloud microphysical processes. So this is really how hydrometeors from a small droplets grow and interact with ice crystals and so on, all the way to the size of precipitation that falls out. Then you have to deal with the radiative effects in a climate model. You have to simulate this, what we the effects we already discussed. Then clouds by condensation in the atmosphere, you release latent heat. Uh, so you have to factor in this diabetic heating of the atmosphere that you have to uh, represent, as well as the interaction with radiation. And then clouds also transport momentum, energy, water, and other bits, and therefore they really drive the global circulation. So all of these things that you have to represent in a climate model. And in, in the coarser climate models, you have to often parameterize it. So just to give you a sense of how this works in a, in a simple sketch, and, and it's obviously much more complicated than drawn out here. Typically, each of them involves many, many equations and is less ad hoc than it looks, but it gives you a good idea of what, what a climate model traditionally would do. So you have a model column here, and the sort of the typical grid spacing, as we said, is order of 100 kilometers. And then you have to realize that within this grid spacing, obviously everything is homogeneously mixed. So you, any sort of the cloud water and so on in principle would be spread out there. But then there's a scheme in the climate model that, that parameterizes the fractional cloud cover. It effectively tells you in my grid box, I have 67% clouds and the rest of it is clear sky. And then you distribute the cloud water into the cloudy bits and the clear sky and the clear bit and you do your calculation separately for clear sky and cloudy. 
This is not trivial because you also have to think of the verticals. So you have uh, in the vertical, you, you have to consider the overlap between different cloud epochs or so not. And then as part of this, you then simulate the mean in cloud liquid and, and ice microphysics. So that is relatively straightforward. The difficulty is often that you, when you deal with convective clouds, and I haven't formally introduced them, so convective clouds are buoyancy driven cloud. And they're basically, think of your typical summer thunderstorm or, or a little fluffy cloud that develops into a, a deeper cloud and, and then into a thunderstorm. But it's also the clouds that drive much of the tropics. And you see some examples actually in my background right behind me. These are big, deep, organized convective systems. And these transport very efficiently uh, both material, but also momentum and other bits between different levels in the atmosphere. And this is typically represented just as a grid box mean here, or column mean mass flux up draft and down draft mass flux. So it's basically goes up and down, but it all is localized into this hundred kilometer column. And then as I said already before, you have to deal with the radiative processes and these are simulated uh, again, typically split, you do a calculation for what's clear sky and cloudy sky separately, and then you average and, and, and weigh it according to cloud fraction again later on to bring it all together. So the problem, some of the problems arise with the representation of clouds in climate models uh, by the fact that you have typically three different schemes that operate. So you have a, this cloud fraction scheme, it tells you how much clouds are there. You have uh, what's called a large scale cloud scheme that deals with these big cloud systems associated with fronts and, and on the larger scale. And you have a convection scheme and they're all in a way plumbed together in, in a clever way, obviously. And they, fun they functioned remarkably well also in the weather forecasts, but uh, they're still not fully consistently covered. And what happened in the last sort of, uh, this was all developed now probably 30, 40 years ago, much of this, or probably 50 years by now, time is flying. But uh, at that time, all these parameterizations were analytically derived or derived with a, with a very clear assumption of scale separation. So the resolved scale would be much coarser than the parameterized scale. What happened now, obviously in the last decades with computing power increasing, the resolved scale gets uh, uh, finer. And so the many assumptions are no longer strictly true. So if you then approach, for example, a scale of 10 kilometers, many of these things that in, in a very coarse model might happen within one uh, grid column, they're no longer local when in, in a formal sense in a, in a higher resolution model. And therefore, when you assume you have just an updraft up and a localized downdraft next to it that, that has a mass flux downward. In the real nature, this wouldn't happening on a 10 kilometer scale, but you might just go 10 kilometers up and then further away, you would have a downward motion and you can't represent this well. So this is a fundamental problem as we get into what's called the gray zone where we partly resolved and partly parametrized, and that makes, makes this part of modeling quite difficult. So now I want to come back to the, to the subtitle of the talk from the single molecule to the Paris Agreement. So after introducing climate models and to really follow a, a, a chain of processes now from, from the single molecule all the way to the globe. Um, I won't make you guess, but uh, what kind of molecule this is on the left. Um, it could look like water, but it's actually SO2 here that's shown. But what do you have to represent in a climate model to capture the relevant processes here? So we'll go through the scale chain and uh, the scale of the molecule is obviously nanometer scale. So the SO2 is emitted in the atmosphere, into the atmosphere by many activities, but quite often by industrial uh, sources. Most fuels, most fossil fuels include SO2. And therefore there's a lot of uh, SO2 emitted in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, it gets oxidized and it forms sulfuric acid and it happens both in cloud water as well as in the gas phase atmosphere. 
And many of you who are a little bit older will obviously remember the phase of acid rain and, and air pollution. And this is basically this a sulfur cycle. So this sulfuric acid is the acid rain that would fall also out uh, as, as, as air pollution was a big topic. But this is still a vapor to start with. Um, but then once you have this vapor, it can form if the supersaturation is uh, high enough, you can form the stable clusters of uh, molecules. And that is there's a simple energy barrier. If you have just two molecules meeting, they're most likely or it's energetically favorable just to break apart again. But if you bring enough together, you, you can uh, overcome an energy barrier that you form this uh, stable clusters and these clusters then subsequently grow. And we call this point the nucleation event where you go from the gas phase into, into the condensed phase. And then these clusters will grow further and they grow by condensation to start with and by coagulation just by random motion they, they meet and, and stick together and then you form particles that are increasingly big until they reach a scale where we say uh, they, they can also serve as what's called cloud condensation nuclei and the cloud condensation nuclei is necessary to form a cloud droplet in the atmosphere. So in the, in the atmospheric conditions, you can't form um, with pure water, you wouldn't form clouds, but these clouds form in these cloud condensation nuclei. If this was too complicated, particularly the PhD students among you, actually, I'm not sure if I switched on the sound on this, but uh, if I haven't, uh, there's a very nice video of where people dance their PhD. And they talk about the aerosol nucleation process. So it won the science. It won won the science uh, a dance your PhD contest. Uh, the link is in in the slide. I can recommend to do it. So they explained in much uh, better uh, detail uh, the nucleation process than I could possibly do here. Problem is, how do you get out of it? Okay. There we go. So aerosols are formed by this nucleation process, but I should mention obviously aerosols are in the atmosphere also by uh, many other processes. And just to give you an image of the earth from space again, so you get aerosols emitted from various sources and you get it from fires, which are shown here at the coast, you have dust blown, you have marine emissions, you have many other bits. And so you tend to have many, many aerosols in the atmosphere. So they tend to be always enough cloud condensation nuclear. Um, and I should mention they're also short-lived. They have a lifetime of about a week only. But then why do aerosols matter? So they have two main effects. So one would be that they uh, reflect sunlight back to space, as you see, by or it's scattering technically, but you can think of it as a reflection. And the fact that you see them from space tells you, obviously, that they, they scatter sunlight back uh, to space there. But they also absorb radiation. And, and both of these uh, tend to have an effect on the top of the atmosphere radiation balance and tend to, on average tend to have a cooling effect on the Earth. But then there's another effect, and this is a particular challenge for climate metal models, as we will see in a minute. And that's nicely illustrated with these uh, satellite images here. So these are clouds over the North Atlantic, and embedded in these clouds, you see these near linear features here. And what these near linear features are, are the tracks of ships going under these clouds. And these ships actually emit aerosols, which serve as cloud, condens cloud condensation nuclei into the cloud deck. And wherever the ship went, the cloud looks brighter. And we understand very well why this is the case. So when you have the same amount of water and you have either few and bigger droplets in a, in a pristine natural environment, or you have more and smaller droplets in a polluted environment, then the cloud that has more and smaller droplets is brighter. So this is called cloud, bright, cloud brightening, or also the Toomey effect by, by Toomey who, who discovered this. We're not particularly concerned about the climate effect of ship tracks, it's not so big, but these are really nice natural analog where we can, or semi-natural analog, where we can really have a defined pollution source and can study this cloud brightening effect quite efficiently. We can, there's a very nice simple theory that you can derive. I won't go into detail, but you can show quite nicely how the albedo A here of this, of a cloud, it depends on the droplet number. And you can see that uh, the 
you get the biggest sensitivity of this cloud albedo, the reflectance of the cloud, if you're in this really clean regimes with low droplet numbers. And this is exactly where we tend to see uh, the biggest radiative effect. So what do you have to now put in a climate model if you want to deal with uh, processes like this? Uh, you have to effectively embed this whole cycle in, in, in climate models all the way from the emission of all these uh, aerosol precursors, uh, from dust, from sea salt, from many other bits, the nucleation we discussed about the growth uh, uh, to larger cloud condensation nuclei, all of this you have to put in a climate model. And, and this has been done. We've done work on this uh, quite a bit ourselves. I show a movie here that's much nicer than our own movie, again, from this uh, NASA nature run because there's a so nice high resolution. What you see here is all the different aerosol cycles represented here. You see the emissions of dust from, uh, which is just lifted by wind from the Sahara. You see again, lifting of sea salt uh, in the high latitudes in the storm tracks. But you see also emissions of, of, from wildfires and just organic emissions from over the, over the tropical um, forests. And obviously a lot of air pollution and so on that's also visualized here. But if we want to study then the climate effects, we have to now couple this aerosol cycle back into our clouds. And just coming back to our simple conceptual model of clouds, what you have to do is uh, first you have to couple the arrows to the radiation scheme. That's relatively straightforward. But then you, we tend to couple the aerosols to this microphysics. And microphysics, again, this is the evolution of hydrometeors, so how cloud droplets and ice crystals evolve. And this is generally considered in climate models. What is not considered at all in current climate models is aerosol effects on convective clouds. And that's simply because the convective clouds are so simply represented in current climate models. So there's a whole class of effects that we currently don't see in our climate models. And I'll come briefly to that in a bit uh, to, to show what, this, uh, what influence this could have. So what effect do the aerosols then have on climate when you simulate this. So this is now from a multi-model intercomparison of climate models in which we bring these models together to, to, to yeah, dig into the differences and try to understand the uncertainties. And what you see here is the mean simulated effective radiative forcing. So there is the imbalance at the top of the atmosphere that you simulate in watts per square meter. And again, as a reference point, CO2 forcing, forcing in the global mean would be uh, 1.7 watts per square meter. And you see, you get these really strong localized forcings here from aerosol effects on clouds, particularly in these cloud decks in the marine areas, because they're clean, as I said before. But when you look at the standard deviation plot on the right hand side here, this is a, a frustratingly high standard deviation. And you can see this also when you look at individual models without naming and shaming now anyone in particular. But just looking at the different patterns, you can see here from these, at that time, it's, a, it's a five years old, but it hasn't changed dramatically, I think, uh, state-of-the-art climate models, their representation of these aerosol cloud interactions and the resulting effects is, is vastly different. Even between two models that are the same base model here, this one in the middle and to the right of it, it's the same base climate model, just a different cloud scheme, and they get very, very different answers. So without going into too much detail, what we can do about it, just to point out the, the uncertainty here is, is very stubbornly large and, and it's something we really have to address. I'll just give you a quick sense. What are the things you can do about it? So we work with, for example, there's a UK climate model and there's really detailed work where we try to see where do these discrepancies come from? We then take, for example, the clouds in this climate model in, in a 2D space and without explaining the technical detail, we cluster them into cloud regimes so that we can look at the different cloud types. And then just, we then can decompose these radiative effects or the climate effect from aerosols on these clouds. And we can, for example, see which cloud decks specifically in what cloud types uh, do these effects come from. And then we can go back to in-situ measurement with aircraft campaigns or with satellite data and, and, and test uh, why, for example, in this thick stratocumulus deck, there's big differences among models. So at the moment, this work we've done only with one model, but there's a lot of activities going on to do this with many climate models. 
So as a whole, this means now that I've, I've demonstrated to you that aerosols tend to have these negative radiative effects at the top of the atmosphere, first by scattering sunlight back to space directly, and second by making clouds brighter and more reflective. When you then look at the combined effect of greenhouse gases and aerosols on climate, you see here the forcing again from greenhouse gases is all positive, so it's a warming effect with relatively small error bars. And the aerosol effects here are negative, a cooling effect with large error bars. And what it effectively means that aerosols at the moment mask a significant part of the effect of greenhouse gases that we don't uh, currently see because it's masked by the aerosol cooling. It's important to keep in mind what I said before, that aerosols are short-lived. So aerosols don't accumulate in the atmosphere. So this masking won't continue. Actually, it, it's much more likely to reverse. And why is that? For the obvious reason that aerosols are not necessarily great to be around. Um, so they're basically air pollution, the, the fundamental part of air pollution. And, and just check the numbers again. So, so WMO estimates that air pollution kills about 7 million people every year. So there's very, very strong incentives to remove aerosols. And this is happening quite actively when you in different parts of the world at different pace. Uh, obviously, Western Europe and, and, and America have done this in the 80s, 90s. In Asia, there's lots of work to do. But in, in China, for example, um, they've begun quite aggressively to desulfurize um, all the fossil fuels that burn. So there's no more SO2 emitted and no more aerosols formed then. And so I think there's a big tendency for this uh, air pollution problem to go away, which is a good thing, but this obviously has implications for climate. So what does it then mean for climate and the Paris Agreement? So now we're reaching the other end of the scales. Well, an interesting, this is a study that, that was done at Max Planck uh, yeah, in, in the two th early 2000s really, where we, develop this climate model with the embedded aerosols. And then in the year 2000, a simple experiment was done just to remove all sulfur dioxide emissions and see what happens to global mean temperatures. If you just cleaned up the world in, in a single day, basically, which is obviously unrealistic, but it's interesting to see what the time scales are. And what you basically get, you get a significant jump in temperature because you remove this cooling effect by aerosols. I would today argue this is probably slightly overestimated in terms of its absolute magnitude, but still there will be a, if we aggressively mitigate air pollution, we will have a temperature jump um, by, by uh, several tenths of degrees. And that is something that then feeds directly back into the, into the Paris Agreement. I just want to illustrate this point. So there's actually a nice, for those of you who haven't probably followed this too much, but there's a nice, very simple relationship between the global mean temperature change and the global carbon emissions, the cumulative carbon emissions. And effectively, so currently Miles Allen has shown this very nicely and effectively can pretty much draw a straight line through here and use this as a, 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 a indicator. And also as a simple tool to estimate how much carbon we have left to, to address a certain temperature target. So if you go to the Paris Agreement, if we want to be at 1.5 degree, yeah, we shouldn't exceed the corresponding amount of carbon. And that's the carbon below. Unfortunately, we're already somewhere here and have already used up this amount of carbon emission. So the remaining carbon budget, net carbon budget, we have to stick to the 1.5 degree uh, that are given in the Paris Agreement is quite small. So this is, in a simple way, just looking at the carbon budget. But now if you think of what would be, what roles do the aerosols play here? And then it becomes interesting. So if you think now you removed all aerosols, and I just illustrate this point, this is not fully quantitative, then you would effectively shift this line up here by our, I mean, from the last slide I had 0.8 degrees, but just to illustrate the point. So you shift this line up here Meaning if you then still want to meet the Paris Agreement, 
you have not much carbon left actually in this extreme illustration here if we were to instantaneously remove all the aerosol forcing we would be in a negative carbon budget so we would have overspent our carbon budget already to reach 1.5 degrees so there's a sort of yeah moral uh, moral problem here that we obviously want to we have to reduce air pollution because it kills millions of people but the more aggressive we do this at the moment the um the more difficult will it be to to actually meet the paris agreement target of 1.5 or 2 degrees so all of this is obviously based and i'll wrap up with just an outlook then here but this most of this is based on these traditional general circulation climate models and I already hinted at that they capture interesting things, but not all the things. And, and there are some things we're particularly interested to see and, and see what climate effects might be there. And so there's things we can do already now quite easily. We can use very high resolution models and these are called cloud resolving models. So we simulate here clouds over the Amazon with a resolution of 1.5 kilometers. And what you see here is these blobs that are moving the it's not moving quickly in zoom, but maybe it starts to move. You see basically the wind speed here and you see precipitation. And then ahead of this precipitation, you get what's called these cold pools. So it's this outflow of the cold air in a big thunderstorm event uh, that you see uh, yeah, before the thunderstorm actually hits. But in these large scale simulations, so these are already very big simulations, uh, we can test now things we can't test in current climate models. We can test how would aerosols interact with convection. And the movie is too slow, I think, on Zoom, but I'll go just to our setup here. So in this baseline simulation, we then put perturbations in and we add here the, in a very simple way, prescribed a perturbation of aerosol optical depth. So that's just a radiative effect of aerosols. And we correspondingly just simply prescribe an analytical function that gives us a corresponding perturbation of droplet number. And just to see what would aerosols do by enhancing droplet numbers and the radiative effects. And just to, for those of you who are interested in more the technical side, so these are big simulations, they're like 3,000 times 2,000 kilometer with a 1.5 kilometer resolution. So this is already a fairly big run. I won't go into all the details. There's a lot of wonderful, subtle cloud physics what happens, but just to give you a sense of what you see over this domain as a function of local solar time. So just throughout the day, we see at some parts of the day, we see actually these aerosol effects substantially increase the cloud amount and that's overnight. And overnight, it would be basically a warming effect because it would tend to trap more infrared radiation that goes to space and then in daytime here, you get a decrease in cloud amount, um, mostly due to the absorbing aerosols in that area. And again, if you decrease the cloud amount in daytime, you tend to also have a warming effect here that, that we're currently missing climate models. And I just wanted to make this point that there's what you would see from a satellite data set would be here, uh, typically at the overpass at, of the satellite at lunch, and you wouldn't see as much. You wouldn't discover any of these other big effects. So this is where models really help uh, to, to augment the observations we already have. So where does this lead us in the future? Well, it's a really a, a new generation of climate models is almost there or on the horizon. So what you see here in the following plot, uh, you see a simulation of uh, just the Earth from three climate models and one satellite data set. And I'll challenge someone if someone wants to dare which one is the satellite and which ones are the models. But if not, don't worry. But uh, yeah, one of them is real and the other ones are models. It's a hard one to see. Fabian, you've, you, you're almost there. Uh, the, the left one. Yeah, no, uh, it's actually the, the second from the right is the, is the satellite data and, and the other three are models. So you just see these, these become remarkably good when we go to this high resolutions. So these are simulated now with, with just several kilometers resolution. You see a little bit that the satellite observation has more these finer structures, these really, the models tend to be too blotchy still. So there's uh, things that are not well resolved, but they're getting remarkably good.
And this is really just the outlook that this is a massive computational challenge. So if you just look at this, in this two and a half kilometer resolution that some of these models run here, and you have 90 vertical levels, you have 6.6 .6 billion grid points. So if you just hold 10 variables in memory without actually, and or just want to store it at a single time step, the output of a model for 10 variables, you have one terabyte of data. But this model at a resolution like this, you have to integrate of time steps of, of several minutes only. Yeah? So you can see it's a massive challenge and, and really it's the biggest computers we currently can have uh, that you need for things like that. I should probably wrap up here. Just want to mention that, yeah, we, we take on the challenge here. So there's a big EU project starting, Next Gems, and there's another one on digital plin, uh, digital twins and digital twin Earth destination Earth. And they're both really kicking off this year. So I think it's a very exciting time to do climate modeling because we suddenly can do things we can't, or we never were able to do. So I'll just wrap up here quite generally and, and just point out to the, the, the main limitations really. So, so we, the general circulation models solve the fundamental physical equations with, with quite refined numerics and so on, which I didn't touch on much here. The resolved scale, I think is, is well represented. The challenge is the unresolved scale and the parameterized processes. Even though current climate models have, have quite good skill and, and, and are very good in, in providing the basis for policy decision, they're, they're still imperfect. And I've showed some examples here that, that people tend to overlook. And many of these imperfections relate to, to clouds and also aerosols and the interactions. And that provides quite a challenge now for, for us being able to assess how, how rapidly do we have to actually reduce the, the carbon emissions to meet the Paris Agreement. I mean, we know we have to do it rapidly, but how rapidly exactly is, is not so clear. And I just put on the, the, the tags again for the future projects that are coming up in this area. So with that, I'll stop here and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Excellent, Th thank you so much, Philip. Um, if you have any questions, either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I also have a couple of questions prepared uh, because you you know, you don't get to talk to a esteemed climate scientist every day. And so I'm gonna start off with one immediately because I think you touched on this exactly. And, I, and this was also what I wondered when I recently read this um, Lilyfeld et al. PNS paper, which I think I'm sure you know. And I, frankly, I, I was a little shocked. <laughs> so, so the, as you said, there's a trade-off between air pollution, aerosols, and uh, 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 global cooling, and th they show that you know removing aerosols, you can can reduce the excess mortality of you know up to five million per year, which is massive, of course. <laughs> also, would lead to more rainfall, right? Wonderful food security, water security, lovely. But as you say, and they estimate that just removing fossil fuel generated aerosols would increase the warming web by 0.5 degrees, right? If you do all air pollution, 0 0.7. Yep. Uh, uh, they say, well, you know, if you are smart and remove, you know, methane and, 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 and sort of short-lived gases, you can, you can offset some of the rapid increase in temperature that would follow to get to 0.36, I think is their, their mean estimate. But I mean, so that is baked in right now. Is that, is that correct? I mean, this is uh, like, if you, you know, if you decarbonize everything, you know, there's not going to be fossil fuel emissions, there's not going to be fossil fuel aerosols, then it just bam, 0.36 hits you uh, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, bam is relative in a sense that the time scale of transformation historically is, tends to be far too slow anyways. So it's, it can be rapid in certain countries, in certain countries. So China has been very aggressive about their, their air pollution strategies now and that's very good for example india which is slightly less spoken about but has worse air pollution in most areas it hasn't been as proactive yet but it it will take time obviously and technologies i, I guess the on the positive side you, you have to take it as a joint challenge because many of these uh, air pollutants in asia are emitted from processes that are uh, very inefficient anyway 
um, yeah. and also so if you were to remove the air pollution you would also reduce the associated greenhouse gas emissions because they're just very inefficient processes so there's a lot of mm. pollution from open fire domestic cooking there's many yeah. of these things improved but regardless you will always if you yeah if you tackle the aerosol problem we've known since 20 years it will ramp things up in, in terms of temperature and it's still the right thing to do so that's yeah. also why we would have to i mean we are already qu quite close to 1.5 degree it's yeah. i mean this effectively yeah. would bring us already beyond yeah. 1.5 degree yeah. that's why there's a lot of or here's a lot of talk about net zero yeah. if not not um not zero you don't want just zero carbon emission you might have to have some negative emissions yeah. you could once you scale that up you might have to offset some of the aerosol cleanup as well so basically basically saying uh yeah it's it's baked in it's just that we are slow to remove the air pollution which means that the increase in temperature due to removing our aerosols will hit us you know slowly basically uh, but it yes but but it is fundamentally there like it's it's yeah it's if just masking the effect yeah if we clean up air pollution, it, it, it is there. And I think it it is a bit larger than in the last IPCC report, most likely. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, it, it is a problem that doesn't go away on its own. Is this, uh, because I'm not at all in this space, of course, but is this something that, it, because I, you know, I, I read this paper, you mentioned it now, but is this something that's discussed? I mean, recently I read a paper actually talking about demand side emissions that don't talk about uh, net, net negative emissions that think you can reach the 1.5 degrees, but but based on this insight, you can't. It's challenging. I wouldn't say you can't, but it's challenging. So I think yeah, there is there there are challenges there. It's it's been known for a long time. I mean, I yeah. think what wasn't clear or what isn't still entirely clear, I think also how aggressively will people clean up mm -hmm. aerosols. It would be good if they cleaned up aggressively, but obviously it's a big transformation too. And it needs funding, it needs help. It's not easy to, uh, for, for, for developing world, it's much harder to clean up. Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of more, but maybe Gabo, you wanna, um, you wanna ask yours? Oh yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, it was, it was great. I, I had a short question uh, around the time when you were discussing Aerocom and showed quite significant standard deviations and then a couple of models, how they are not really matching up. Yeah. I was wondering about the, the available measurement data for this. So what is the spatial and time resolution and what is the extent of the coverage? Uh, can you compare the simulations or how does the resolution of the simulations compare with the actual measurement data? No, that's a, that's a very good point, and and I, I could speak a whole hour about it. That's why I didn't even touch on it. Uh, the the evaluation of these processes is is really complicated, and for pretty much most of the prior time, evaluation was to evaluate the base state of climate models against uh, some observation, typically satellite data, because that's the only thing we have with global coverage. Mm -hmm. You have satellite data sets with a resolution of, say, a kilometer, a climate model, say, order of 100 kilometers. You can do it in a statistical sense, and you have enough data statistically. The problem is you can have, you, you always have somebody, it's, so some people speak of validation of these models. You can't validate a climate model because it, you can evaluate it because you'll never have a binary true false decision. They always have some biases and you hope you get the base state good enough to trust then the simulated perturbations. That's what, what we hope for. But that alone isn't a constraint on the processes. So when you think of aerosol cloud interactions, it's not enough to say evaluate the aerosols and we can just evaluate the extinction from a satellite data and to evaluate the cloud and hope that the aerosol cloud interactions are well simulated. And it's particularly poor for aerosol and clouds because you can't retrieve from a satellite uh, the aerosols when there's a cloud. So when you want to do the interaction, you have to make assumptions about representativeness. So if you have a measurement in one point next to a cloud, is it representative for what will go into the cloud? And that is not always the case. So, but I think we've, we're learning a bit. And, and so the next, what we in a couple of projects work on is where we really want to, rather than evaluate with the base state, we want to 
evaluate the uh, relationships between these variables. For example, you could just do a simple sensitivity of D cloud droplet number, D aerosol optical depth, and that has been done for quite some time. But bringing all these constraints together, I think is the only way that brings us forward. Right. It would Thank be really you. cool though, because he asked about scales with his new climate models with these ultra high resolutions. And we will actually put in some aerosols to do this on the same scale as the satellite sensor would be would be fantastic if you can so, handle the data. So there can be a funny situation here that maybe the accuracy of the simulations will increase faster than the accuracy of the measurements. And maybe the measurements at some point can be made more accurate based on the simulation data. That's yeah, that would be interesting discussions when you get there. That would be a funny scenario. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Dan, I think you also have a question. That's right. Let me turn on my video as well. All right. Thanks for uh, for this very nice talk. So my my question is about it relates to the uh, the fourth uh, bullet point here on your conclusion slide. So you discussed a lot about the uncertainties relating to uh, aerosols, clouds, and convection processes. Yeah. And I wonder how you uh, see this in relation to the uncertainties from from other sources. I mean, there's the behavior of the ocean. Yeah. Uh, there's the uh, the ice caps agreement and and and, um, and Antarctica. There's the in internal the natural variability of the climate system. So all that contributes to the uncertainty. I wonder if you if you think that these are the ones relating to clouds and aerosols are the are the main ones, or it's 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 an important ingredient but not necessarily dwarfing the other ones. How do you see that? No, it's it's a very good point. I think. It comes handily as a cloud physicist that quite often the general conclusion is that sort of clouds drive a lot of the intermodal spread. Um, but you're totally right. There's many, many other things that are super important, particularly on the impact side. I mean, ice models, ice sheets, the representation is extremely poor. There are many other processes we don't capture well with there's predictions. I mean, the, the Antarctic is, is melting faster than people had anticipated and, and we don't capture all of these things. I'm not claiming this is the only uncertainty, so you're totally right. It's quite hard to make it a quantitative answer to say, um, based on this, we, we can say what the uncertainties are because it depends, uh, or what the ranking of uncertainty would be, because it depends a lot on the question you're asking. It's simply when you look at the intermodal spread in, in say climate sensitivity, I think you, it's, easy to show that a lot of this relates to cloud feedbacks mm -hmm. and also then to aerosol effects and the interaction. And particularly in the CMIP-6 model, so the latest model inter comparison, we found that quite a few models uh, had an increased climate sensitivity, so a stronger warming in response to known uh, CO2 forcing. And this related to the fact that their cloud phase uh, treatment was changed and improved, uh, where they had uh, less uh, less frozen water and more super cooled liquid and so on so i think we can we can trace it down but i'm not answering your question well in terms of giving it a ranking because i it's quite difficult to do now but i understand that you so you you focus primarily now on the, on the climate sensitivity as sort of a um, way of comparing um, these, these different contributions to uncertainty, which is, of course, a different thing than saying, well, I'm going to look at the projections a couple of decades ahead or a couple of centuries ahead, which, which would be uh, yeah. different uh, criteria. Yeah, it will depend a lot on the time scale. And, and I guess, mm -hmm. I mean, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. I mean, there's all these Earth system or the, the, the biogeochemical cycles could be methane degassing and all these things I think we know could be important, but we just we don't represent them well enough at all to say, I think, how how uncertain these are. So it's it's a quite difficult one, but yeah. But by no means should I claim this is the only thing that matters. Thanks. Is, uh, is Andrew Wells still um, working on ice ice sheets? Of course, yes. Because he yes. yeah he was a uh, he was my fluid fluid dynamics tutor. So and every example was always about ice sheets. So <laughs> all my fluid dynamics is always based on uh, the same examples. So. Yes, no, Andrew Andrew is right. still very active. I mean he works, and that's an exciting bit because he just works generally on these really small scales and 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 how these how these really matter for for the ice locally. But it's it all comes together. I think as piece of the puzzle, but. Yeah, so, so one other question I had 
and you you mentioned briefly when you talked about aerosols, then you know you might overshoot, uh, and then you know later you, you you suck it out again, and I think in you know in the majority of one point five scenarios you actually overshoot, and then somehow we we scale up the technology and then you exceed, uh, you you go down again. So, um, but this overshoot can last for quite a while actually, uh, sometimes decades, and I'm I'm wondering. I mean, we had a talk by. You know, Dongers from the peak on sort of tipping elements in the climate system, where then you, you you pass a certain threshold where then irreversible damage uh, might just progress. Uh, of course, it depends on the system, right? I mean, you, you, if you have the cell no propagation, you go down, you tip, and then it might take centuries to go to the other stable equilibrium, like with the Greenland ice sheet. And maybe there's even a window where you then can pull it back again. Uh, is are there some uh, elements? in the in the climate system where this overshoot would already tip and then even if you suck it out you would you would just not get it back it's do, not do my, it's not my mm. speciality um i think i mean i i'm still a bit of an optimist and hope that we can avoid really i mean i guess at some point things will crack and there must be tipping point i mean without being an expert on that topic i would hope that that things might stay below that and that that many of these things are if you don't hit these tipping points you, you tend to be quite predictable in a sort of in a global mean sense that forcing alone tells you a lot about the, the temperature curve um it but this is more an informed uh, yeah more an informed opinion than expert opinion mm. it's, it's not my, not my area I mean, this overshooting obviously leads to, for many people, to the other question, uh, the one we all much rather like to avoid is should you involve some kind of solar radiation management um, yeah. to, to avoid overshooting. Uh, and I guess there's a community that, that researches it quite cautiously, but just uh, for, should there be a climate emergency, should we deploy things like cloud brightening yeah. or, or stratospheric aerosols? And, yeah, these are difficult questions. It's not a preferred solution, I think, but uh, some people or quite a big community actually does this research just to be prepared should it be necessary. Yeah. But I'm not a big proponent of it. Yeah, I guess it's good to have some insurance, but uh, you know, a small amount of people should work on it, but it shouldn't be the dominant also mainstream uh, 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 um, communication from the media. I mean, on this tipping point issue, uh, I mean, I remember uh, John gave this talk, and you know, he had this nice, rather simple, you know, two cusps being being being, you know, coupled, and then some risk analysis also with the recent work. What what is you know, you talked about like really physically realistic climate models. I mean, how well do they represent these potential tipping elements and the, sort of the cascading effects that they that they have? It's a good question. It's I mean these. Do you mean how well do the complex climate models? Yeah, kept exactly. Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's not, and and it's hard to test them. I mean, you have a few yeah. sort of these extreme scenarios, and 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 people come back to snowball Earth scenarios or so, and how do you how do you get in and out of snowball Earths and so on? And I don't think this is entirely clear yet, and these models are perfect in capturing that. Um, but you would need to. It's hard to say how good they are unless you have reliable data. And I think if you go a lot to paleo data, there's mm -hmm. many ways to get the same answer. So I tend to be a bit skeptical sometimes. We, we fully, I mean, obviously we must be able in, statistically to reproduce sort of the paleo record. Yeah. But it's quite hard to sing, simulate individual events if you have one representation of what happened from many, many possible. So yeah. yeah. I don't, didn't answer that too clearly, but it's 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 hard to find to define the test cases. I think that's a problem. Hmm. Okay. Then um, let maybe there's something in the chat before I go on. Um, so I'm reading this from Peter Isaga. Is aerosol cleanup a process isolated from other processes that influence temperature? Is the intervention uh, effective? Yeah, I guess you can also see. Yeah. Well, the, that's what I, what I hinted at before. I think no, the, I think the challenge is to couple these. Uh, you have to do both, and and say if you would say 
uh, car traffic is the main source of air pollution in an area, which it contributes in many areas. If you go electric with fully renewable energy, you tackle both at the same time. But the problem is time scales. So the, the yeah. time scales are the real issues that CO2 forcing accumulates and there's a long-term bit, um, aerosol forcing drops very quickly. So you get a very quick response to it while, while for CO2, it, it obviously has, the current forcing you see with CO2 has built up since pre-industrial times. The current forcing you see with aerosols has been built up since last week. Yeah. That's a lifetime. Yeah. And if you switch it off, it's gone in a week. And it, so that's a really, that's why the CO2 changes are quite slow. And say, take COVID. Um, yes, you see a small blip in the CO2 curve, but not much. Yeah. For the cumulative CO2, it doesn't matter much. For aerosols, it did a bit more, but for, for CO2, the lifetime is so long. Yeah. Then uh, another thing, I mean, you mentioned the carbon budget, uh, uh, and I, I recently read this article by, by Glenn Peters, 2018, sort of beyond carbon budgets, where apparently there was all these, you know, uncertainties or controversies of, oh, we don't have any carbon budget there, versus, oh, we have way more than we thought we had. Uh, and apparently there's a, there's a difference, uh, there's the threshold exceedance budget, basically, okay, this is the stuff you can emit until you first cross. And then there's this threshold avoidance budget where you say, by the end of the century, you know, I'll have this avoided yeah. with net negative, you know, with, with emissions that, that go down. And he points to, you know, a couple of, of examples also, just this definition, then other choices we make with respect to, you know, non-CO2 uh, mitigation, um, what temperature baseline we take and so on. So basically says, look, this, this has served its purpose, but now it's actually more confusing than helpful. Is that something you, you agree with or can you maybe talk about this? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the closer you get, the, the bigger the error margins matter. I mean, it, it's pretty clear it's urgent and I think we need the fastest possible change. And if you, if you really boil it now down in tons of carbon, I'm not sure it's so helpful. Mm. It's pretty clear you have to transform everything on the time scale of, of yeah, decades. Not more than two decades, which is unheard of. So, so I think, yeah, to, to specifically, I, I use this more as an illustration, the one plot with mm. the carbon budget, but to specifically now tie down to a specific line and the exact budget, I'm not sure that's what we should aim for, because we have to get the technology to do it, any budget uh, scale yeah. up. Yeah. Okay, Rita, are you um, raised your hand? Yeah, I have a, a question that relates in part to the tipping points question that they, they usually derive from the coupling of the diverse Hertz systems. And I was wondering if these very high resolution models that you've talked about, do they assume that all the land dynamics is static or are, are these land dynamics also coupled in these models? It's uh, shockingly simple to start with. Um, at the moment, so there's one model intercomparison study, Diamond, which if you're interested, you can find, find nice papers about it. And that has gone as far as simulating 40 days with these models. Um, just to give you a scale of reference, so the current last CMIP model intercomparison exercise, CMIP-6, asked for a total of 52,000 simulation years. So something like CMIP, we, we're decades away of being able to do with it. It's really, I think it, this is about learning um, in the next GEMS project, we're kicking off in September, we, we promise to do 40 years. And again, you see 40 years is not enough to simulate transient tipping points and so on. But I think what we can do now is we can put in perturbation experiments. So the, the original diamond runs, they're just the base state. There's no, it's just present day base state and look at what does the earth look like. And now in these projects, we, we can put perturbations in, you can ramp up greenhouse gases, we will put in simple aerosols and we will just see how different is the response in something like this as compared to a traditional model. And I think there will be many surprises. It will not be straightforward. And for example, the aerosol effects we see in this really idealized runs we see here, they, I'm slightly worried, they could knock off the radiation balance of a climate model potentially and we'll have to think quite hard 
how to get this right. Uh, obviously, in nature, they don't knock off the radiation balance, but it will be will be a learning curve. I think it's something we haven't had to do for some time. And one thing you could you could also develop these interventions in terms of what's happening on the on land. So say there is for a certain temperature, maybe half of the Amazon is going to disappear. So you could do that experiment. Absolutely. And and so there's I know in next gym, so so there's there's land and so there's sort of three main sort of themes, but land is one of the themes. And again, it won't be sort of on the time scale. It's less about probably having this fully I mean, it will be development of land components in an earth system model, but it, it's less about the ultra complexity. It's more yeah, how we can test some of these. And, and just one, one little question uh, that has to do with, so, so we've seen over the years, the dramatic increase, I guess, to some extent of the resolution, right? And has that increase in resolution led to say different results, has, has it, like reduce uncertainty only, or has it shifted the the mean or the extremes in in some way, or uh, are are we getting anything out of it? <laughs> well, that's a good question, and I think that's that's yet to so. There's two 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 types of increases in resolution. There's a, the classical GCM type increase in resolution that's gone gradually from 500 to maybe. 100 and maybe now 50 kilometers or so, but this is still with fully parametrized convection. Uh, and, and so I think that you see differences in model behavior and particular certain things are hard to get in the course resolution of uh, things like blocking, uh, where you have very persistent weather features and that are often, um, they're, they're often the underlying cause of extreme events like of, of heat waves or so. So these blocking frequencies change and so on. But this is still sort of on the unresolved scale. We don't know yet at all, I think, what this means when we go cloud resolving and try to do climate right. At the moment, this is basically a weather run of 40 days. It will be good to know, but I think it will be, a, I mean, the great thing is EU has taken this fantastically forward, this digital twin earths. I mean, these are massive programs and I think we'll learn a lot. Unfortunately, the UK hasn't signed up to digital Europe, just to Horizon Europe. Always time to move uh, countries, come to the continent. <laughs> um, the, the, I, I have two more questions. I mean, one is more uh, a big picture thing where, you know, the, the majority of IPC scenarios assume this really large scale negative emissions that, uh, are pretty controversial, right? So, so I want to get your take on this. I mean, there's the Anderson Peters, I think the science article is quite damning. Bex is nowhere near the size of, of this. So I want to get your sense of why have they been allowed to play such a large role? Is that feasible? What's being done there? What's the current mood in the climate science community? I mean, do you all think this is insane or do you all think, yeah, we, we could do it? So that's that's one aspect. But then the other aspect is that they also assume really the scenarios historically unprecedented decoupling from from GDP growth and, and 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 material use from emissions, right? And if you look at material use and GDP growth to emissions, I mean it's a perfect like like really it's 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 like CO two and temperature basically, um, uh, and you know you you sometimes I get this sense I get this okay 2015 renewable is made you know 20 40 percent of electricity right in 2020 I computed this recently it was nearly 30 percent right and then you're like yeah you know we're making it. But then you look at absolute increase in fossil fuels and they also have increased, right? And the climate doesn't really care whether you, you get proportionally better. So I'm, so I'm wondering, yeah, what's your view on this green growth idea? And, and also why is it, I think you've been part of the IPCC also, like, can you talk a little bit about, yeah, why this is sort of the dominant um, view? Yes. To be honest, I, I think it's partly in because it's necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I think with mm -hmm. zero emissions, if you just say we go to zero, you just can't uh, get there. I think that that's some of the point that if you the negative you emissions, you mean? Yeah, if you don't have yeah. negative emissions, if if you stick to zero, yeah, um, then it, it's very hard to get 
to where you want to be. So I think you, because there will be some emissions always there. You won't get rid of yeah. all emission sources. Uh, you need to compensate. I mean, the question so is of that, scale, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert of scaling it. And, and I, many of my colleagues are, but what encouraged me really in the last, even the last year or so, for, for all the time I've done climate science, people have talked about stuff like carbon capture and so on, but the investment was yeah. marginal. Yeah. And suddenly things go very different. The UK just put in a hundred million. Uh, we're putting up a big center that, that actually Oxford is leading this. Uh, we have a whole new center on energy transformations and, and scoping. So I think the momentum, even just locally, I see around me is, is much more than, than I've seen before. So that's a total non-expert answer. But yeah. I, I'm more hopeful just by seeing how many of my colleagues really work on it very hard suddenly that, that maybe haven't done this before. But yeah, it's not an expert answer. And the, but this is focused on direct air capture. This or... would be on all different uh, scenarios. So there's a lot of different ideas uh, that I think, but I think all of them get now more attention and investment. And I think there's a lot of private money going into it too. And a lot of uh, 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 NGOs and charities actually supporting this research. I, I, I think suddenly something is happening that hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. if that's good enough I, I, I can't judge but it, it gives some hope I think yeah yeah and on the decoupling of, of growth and emissions I guess that's a uh, um I've done the same exercise as you before where I looked at yeah. uh, as a, a reviewed papers and I wasn't happy and 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 yes everything correlates with with uh, sort of with population and, and GDP but yeah but on the other hand, I think technologically you can see that the decoupling is possible with all the technology that's even out there now. Um, yeah, you can take sure. a country, well, you could, well, to some degree, you can take a country like the US and just make it as energy energy efficient as Europe. Yeah. With the current technology, you don't need to develop anything, and you would have massive energy savings. Yeah. So I think there's some some hope in that, but yeah, again, way out of my expertise. This is hmm. more yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was, uh, <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, okay. Then uh, then I won't. Uh, uh, this is this is uh, this is satisfying. I mean, uh, it's good to hear that there's a, there's investment uh, uh, going into this carbon carbon capture. Yeah, I think um, so. necessary necessary step. Um, I have one last thing, which. Yeah, it's also more like a big picture. So, so as I apologize a little bit, but I, I was struck by I was reading through this global carbon budget paper. This 2020, they, they do this every year, and that they use data from BP, right, from British Petroleum. And it, it struck, it, you know, I felt a little unease that you know, that sort of uh, an industry that has spread misinformation, disinformation over you know, the last 50 years, which is one of the main reasons why we haven't acted before, is relied upon so strongly in this report. But then I noticed. Well, they actually calculate the imbalance, so it's probably accurate data, and it's all fine. But that made me wonder: what is there a does the fossil fuel industry have? What's their role in the climate science? Uh, uh, do, do they fund departments? Do they fund certain research areas? Um, and more generally, what are sort of the the companies or institutions that are that are investing in climate science? Um, I, I think yeah, I'm interested in that not for nefarious reasons, but I but I think I mean. This is just going to transform the planet. So I'm curious who is sort of thinking. You know, I'm sure the military is 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 hard on there, but I'm I'm curious to hear your view from inside the community. A good question. I mean, it's primarily it's got, it's public money that goes into climate science. I think that's a vast yeah. vast majority of funds. Um, I think the private sector as a whole, we, we'd hope. They want to engage more and they could engage more. Hmm. But then there's obviously certain parts of the climate sectors with vested interests, in, like the fossil fuel sector. And it depends a lot who you talk to. And, and we had this discussions internally and so on. Uh, you could have two choices. You can say it's, it's simply putting the neutrality of climate science in risk if you were to accept funding. Mm -hmm. Or you could, as one of my colleagues would argue, say you have to engage with their sector because they are the ones who will lead the change or will have to contribute to the change. And, and so one 
one suggestion was uh, if one engages with a fossil fuel sector, one could make them sign up to our we have sort of principles for net zero yeah. uh, from the Oxford Martin School. And if they sign up to it, then that's great. That means they would have to have a plan to net zero by 2040 or so. Yeah. And that, that you could help to transform them mm. personally. That's my personal opinion. I think it, there's a risk of credibility, but we have to be yeah. quite careful. Yeah. But not everyone agrees. Yeah. 